how many of you have surrendered all? Oh, it's kind of quiet. Let me talk to you for a few minutes today. Would you turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 9? God bless you all. So good to see each and every one of you. To be a part of the experience of seeing what God is doing in each and every life here. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 36. We got it? Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord says, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alm deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was near to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Eternal and heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this another day another opportunity to gather together. We seek to hear a word from you this day. So I ask, Lord, that you would let your will be done. And everyone that is here now, and everyone who will hear this word, Lord, at any time in the future, let your perfect will be done, Lord. Father, begin with me. Please let thy anointing rest upon thy servant, that I might speak your oracles according to your will, that you and you alone would be glorified. Father, please feed your servants who will hear your word this day. And if there are any who have not made up their mind to serve you completely, prick their heart this day, Lord, that salvation might be wrought in them and that all in all you would be glorified. Father, we ask this today in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you a little bit today about a beautiful death. A beautiful death. You know, there's so much connotation around death nowadays. People really don't view it as, as beautiful. But it is, and it should be, and it can be beautiful. As I was thinking on this word, I began to think about Stella Lee Gonzalez. None of y'all know Stella Lee. At least I don't think any of y'all know her. She was my great aunt. She passed on many years ago. But I remember her as a, 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 a young lad. Stella Lee was something else. You understand? She was a, a piece of work. She had a one-of-a-kind personality. She was um, a woman that was short in stature, but she was uh, a keg of dynamite, if you would. She was known for always having her her can with a brown paper sack on it with a Budweiser in it. And no matter whenever she saw us, she wanted a kiss. And so you was going to get a kiss and a, some Budweiser whenever you saw her. Lying and fighting were her calling card. We used to play dominoes together and she would hide dominoes everywhere she could think of as long as she could win. 
She was a character. She was hard not to love her, but she was hard to love, if that makes sense. And I remember somewhere along as I began to age and I begot, became a teenager, she had stopped drinking. And she had stopped scratching off. And the, the calls and the requests that she used to give me, God, would you carry me to the store so I can get a, a, a Budweiser? Can I get a beer? They changed. She would want, always wanted me to carry her to the store to get her uh, some ice cream or some candy. That was now what she would, would have a craving for. I remember those days. And I remember going to her funeral. And we sat there in her funeral and it was the most beautiful thing. Person after person began to get up and talk about my Aunt Stella Lee. But it wasn't the Aunt Stella Lee that I grew up with that they were talking about. You see, my aunt, she, she never got a driver's license. She always either rode the bus or she depended on somebody to, to take her where she needed to get. But there were people that came to her funeral that weren't in our family. And they began to stand up and they began to say, I knew Stella Lee. She was an awesome woman of God. I met her on the bus. And I didn't know her from anybody. But we found ourselves riding the same route. And she would talk to me about Jesus. And because she talked to me about Jesus, I got saved. And then my husband got saved. And we just wanted to come today to her funeral to acknowledge her and what she had done for us. And they sat down and somebody else got up and talked about something that she had did. And before us, as we sat there in this funeral, this beautiful death began to present itself to us in there. Things that we didn't see and things that we didn't know began to unfold to demonstrate this beautiful death that she had experienced. See, I'm not talking about the death where she was laid out in the casket. That's, that's not the death I'm talking about. I'm talking about the death where she made up her mind to transform her life by trusting Jesus Christ. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Where she said, you know what? The Budweiser won't do anymore. Come on. The lying, the cheating, and the cussing will no longer suffice. Yeah. I must be about my father's business. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, 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 it was beautiful to experience that. The, see the works that God had done in her and had used her to accomplish was beautiful. And I remember leaving that funeral feeling so uplifted because I had seen the handiwork of God. I think about the eulogy that the pastor gave about her and how he talked about her. You know, I looked that word up, eulogy, and it's basically, it's a speech or a piece of writing that highly praises someone who just died. And I thought that was interesting. I, 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 I wondered, having given eulogies before, more than I would have preferred to give. I've experienced that every eulogy you give ain't necessarily anything that's worth being praised about the person who just died. But yet the definition of a eulogy is to provide high praises to somebody that just died. Wow. And my question became is, well, what do you do if there's nothing that's praiseworthy about that person? Wow. We live in a society nowadays where people will live life any way they want to. And the expectation is that the pastor will come after their death and push them over into heaven. Yeah. They'll now rely on things that they did where well, they sang a song back in seventh grade right. in the youth choir one time. Right. Surely they're in a better place. Yeah. And when they can't find any church relationship, well, you know, they, they played basketball. They ran real fast. Yeah. They was a good domino player. These become the things that they provide high praise for. You know, I was wondering. My son and I, we were at the 
we were at the mall yesterday and he leaned up against the railing on the second floor. Y'all mind if I talk to you today? Amen. I, I, I told him, I said, don't lean on that, son. Don't lean on that. You don't know whether or not that'll fall. Don't lean on it. I don't want to be put in a situation where I'm here trying to catch you. And that thought left lingered with me as we, we left and went on about our business that day. And I wondered if I was put in a situation where I had to try to save somebody in a situation like that. And what if I was able to save them, but I died myself? Wow. Trying to pull them back. I was able to get enough inertia to get them away from the side. But in doing that, I lose my footing and I fall to my death. Mm. I begin to think about that. Is that such a bad death? If one of the young people I was able to step in front of a bullet for them, I've lived my life. I've had children. I've got gray hair. I've done some things. How bad would it be if they put me in a box but one of these young people were able to continue to live? But I also begin to think, what if that young person that I saved their life decided that they wanted to be a drug dealer? A whole pimp. A three, four time offender. What a waste that would be. And then I begin to think about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And I look at some of the decisions that people make in this world and I wonder, what a waste. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us on Calvary. It was a beautiful death. His focus, though, was not on the death. His focus was on his being separated from his father. See, Jesus was not concerned about dying. He knew he was going to be resurrected again. Yeah. That's not what the issue was. He wasn't in the Garden of Gethsemane because he didn't want to die. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane because he didn't want to be separated from his father. He had enjoyed the presence of his father continuously, but he knew he had a task before him where he had to take on the sins of the world. And that would have to separate him from his God. Oh, I'm sorry to mess up some people's theology, but the word of God says that Jesus has a God. Yes, right. He refers to him as my God yes. over in Revelations because he is not his own father. He has a God. Yes, the word of God says that he is not ashamed to be called our brethren because we are all children of God. Yeah. But I wonder sometimes is. Is God get, what is God getting? on his investment of his sacrifice from you. Good question. Beautiful death. As I said, it's not about a homecoming. It's about making the decision to be dead in Christ. That's how Paul puts it in the word. He says, I'm dead in Christ. And for those that are dead in Christ, well, what does it mean to be dead in Christ? Has to be the question if we're going to truly experience a beautiful death. The word of God says that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he had to tell the Lord, I don't want to do this. If there's another way to do this, let's do that. But nevertheless, Lord, whatever your will is, let's do that and not my will. See, he had to make the decision to cast away his own life, his own value, his own desires. See, he had to make the decision that his life was no longer going to be his own. That's where we're at today. We have to make a decision. Is our life going to still be our own? We get caught up today in, in society. 
The world tells us that your life is your own. The world tells you to live it up. Do what you want to do. Do what you feel like you should do. The world tells you you're your own God. They make commercials. You deserve it. Have it your way. It's designed to appeal to our flesh. Because we don't understand what life is actually all about. Life is not about the lies that are posted on social media. Where people take pictures about how they went to Cancun and how they went to Hawaii. And they never seem to get around to posting the pictures about how their electricity is cut off the next month because they don't have money to pay for it. These lies and the deceptions that the world have been caught up in, that you can do whatever you want to, whenever you want to, however you want to, for as long as you want to, and get to that great and final day, and everything's going to be okay. It's madness. The Word of God says over in Romans 6, chapter 4, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans 6 and 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Paul begins to speak of this beautiful death that we should experience. That when we follow Jesus Christ and we humble ourselves, even as he has commanded us to humble ourselves, that there is a promise that is given unto us. That we will be raised up from the dead by the same glory that raised up Jesus Christ and that we should walk in the newness of life. This belief that we can say that we follow Jesus, say that we serve him, Say that we are dead in Christ and continue to live the same old life is a lie straight from the pits of hell, even though it is perpetrated time and time again in churches today. Men stand up in pulpits, women stand up in pulpits. The, they ain't quite sure what they are on Wednesday and definitely confused on Friday. Stand up in pulpits and they want to proclaim that you can just say that you have experienced the beautiful death. And continue on as if nothing changed. As if somehow the power of God does not have the ability to come into your life and change it. That word newness means the act of replacing something that is worn out, run down, or broken. Word, I want you to know that when you experience the beautiful death, when you surrender your will to that of God, that there's going to be a newness in your life. Yes, hallelujah. You see, I've told you this before and I tell you again, and I'm sure that if the Lord give me another opportunity down the road, I'll tell you again. We serve a God of evidence. Yes. One of the things I learned as my job as a process engineer, is just because somebody says something don't mean something. I remember going in the rooms and asking people, is this happening in your process? And everybody from the person on the floor all the way up said, yes, vice president, absolutely it's happening. I make sure it's happening. I said, are you sure it's happening? Yes, we're sure. We're absolutely 100 percent sure it's happening. And we go out on the floor and observe the process and it wouldn't be happening at all. Because one of the first things that we got taught was is just because somebody says a thing doesn't mean that that's what it is. If the evidence don't line up to what's being said, then there's a problem somewhere. Either there's been a tampering with the evidence or there's been a deception on the other part. Well, let me let you know right now, God's evidence can't be tampered with. 
But what we do struggle with is a deception on our part to believe that we're doing something that we're not. Behold, I have kept the commandments of the Lord. Okay, well, then what's all this noise of these animals I hear back here? Behold, I have died in Christ. Okay, then, then how come we can't count on you to be in church on time three weeks in a row at all, all year? I'm dead in Christ. You reading this, you read today? No. We say we've died. We say we've surrendered. We said that we put God's desires and his will before ours. But somehow we struggle to produce fruit that validates that. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. You know, I, I've, I've been to a lot of funerals. Done quite a few eulogies now. Stood by quite a few deathbeds. That's just one of the callings of a preacher. That's the thing we do. If you do it long enough, brothers, you'll get a phone call if you haven't already. But what I've learned is there are two types of people. When you go to a deathbed. When you go visit somebody in the hospital or at their house in hospice and they know they're not getting up out that bed. They know they're not going back to the church house. They know they're not going back to the football game when when the Cowboys no longer is important. When when, when the cares about who the Spurs drafted are insignificant. When what's happening on days of our lives no longer makes the top priority in their thought process. But only the constant advance of death. When you're able to look into a man or a woman's eyes, there's only two types of people. There's one that's going to die and there's one that's already died. Mm -hmm. And I want you to tell you that it's night and day difference. We used to tell people all the time when they'd be calling us for insurance and they would say, I can't believe I'm paying all this money for this insurance. I want you to lower my rates. That's what they tell us. And so we say, well, let's walk through your policy with what you got and let's see what you got. And we tell them, well, you got this coverage and over here. Well, I don't need that. <laughs> OK, well, you got these numbers. This is how much protection you have here in this area. Can we lower that? Well, what about this over here? You have to have that. Can I get rid of it? No, you can't. The state requires you to have that if you're going to drive your vehicle. We go through this round and around and around and around and around. And they would strip, strip all of these coverages off. And they would get a quote. And they say, well, that's a little better. Let's go with that. And I would tell them before we would, get, before we would make the change. I said, I want you to understand there's two types of people that have a claim. I said, there's those that will go to bed and sleep good. And there's those that won't. There's one that is protected in times of trouble. And there's one that's not. Word, I want you to understand that if you're not serious about serving Jesus Christ, you're going to find yourself in the not confident section. You see, all of the lies go away. They begin to roll away as the heart starts to slow down. As the body starts to reject, as the taste of your favorite dish of, and your meal no longer brings value to you. When the chitlins don't move you no more. When the ribs and the collard greens don't do it for you anymore. When you ain't got a taste for what you used to get a second helping of. There begins to be a change. And the things of this world that have no value and have no importance begin to roll away. And there's only that death. So many times we wrestle with what life really, truly is. We fall prey to what the world says about life. And we fail to truly understand that our life is a gift from God. Yes. God is the creator. He made us. He designed us. And he has a perfect will for each one of us. 
I think about my life now and what I do here at Word Deliverance Ministries, and I even think about what I do in my business. And it is so far removed from what I thought it was going to look like. And I look back over my life and very little in my life has gone the way that I wanted it to go. But I can see now God's hand and his providence working in every bit of it. I never wanted to go to the military. But it was a profound blessing. And I live in a house now that the benefits and the decision that I made there helped to make that possible by the grace of God. I never wanted to be an insurance. I never pictured myself as an insurance man. The insurance man was the guy that wore a little plain suit with the penny loafers and came to your house, knocked on the door. <laughs> Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. I never wanted to be that. I had grand visions. I wanted to be a DJ. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to be in the club in Las Vegas and in Miami, spinning tracks, people knowing me. I had a chance to do a little bit of that, but that's not what God had for me. But now I look back and I realize that if I hadn't been at USAA, then a certain young lady wouldn't have been able to send me a text message when she got her job up there to say, hello, Mr. Barnes, how are you doing? I just want you to know that I, I'm up here. Oh, yeah, I think on those things. Didn't make sense then, but it makes sense now. The, the song says, well, we'll understand it better. By and by is the truth. Young people, it doesn't have to make sense to you now. <laughs> Just trust what you're being told. I talk to my son all the time and I marvel at him because it's hard to tell him anything. Yep. As gray and bald headed as I've gotten, he still thinks he knows better than I know. Yeah. Yeah. We got them all set up now. They got bank accounts now. I took each one of them up there, got their own bank account. They get their own monies. They go into their bank account. They each one got their debit card. But now guess what they got to do? Oh, see, it's fun swiping daddy's card. Oh, but the game changes when you got to swipe your card. See, when you give lessons about do you really need that? Oh, yes, I need it. I need it. I got to have it. I really want it. Oh, yeah, you want it with my card. I say you can have it today. Go on and swipe your card away. Then all of a sudden, that thing that was so important, that was dire, that they just had to have. You know, I think I can do without that today. I can sacrifice that. Life has this way about coming on you and bringing a reality to you that you don't understand or that you don't have before it comes. I talk to my children all the time about the big R. I say, yeah, you think that way because you're not factoring in the big R into your equation. They're like, what the big R? The big R is responsibility. See, just like my children have problems today, there are people that are laying in hospitals right now that are never coming out and they have not acknowledged the big R. Yeah. They've lived their life how they wanted to and now they've gotten to the end of it and they realize I've been reckless. Yeah. Yeah. I've been reckless in my decision making. I've been reckless in my spiritual finances. And now the judgment is coming. The word of God says that a man was going to go on a journey. He came unto his servants and he distributed talents to them. And he went away. The word of God says after a long time, he returned to reckon with them. See, we got people living lives like that. God not going to reckon with them. The word of God says that the Holy Spirit gives out gifts separately according to his will. Yeah. The word of God says that Jesus came. He says, I'm going to go and prepare you a place, but I'm coming back. See, there's going to be a reckoning. 
says that the servants, each one came before me, says, Lord, you gave me X amount of talents. And here it is. I have returned those talents and like mine unto you, likewise unto you. See, God has given us talents and abilities, but we act like we're not going to be held accountable for how we use them. Word of Deliverance Ministries is a small church, but there are more than enough people here to accomplish everything we have to do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We just got to be dead in Christ. That's it. There should be no reason why we have young people in here between the age of 13 and 17 that aren't in a choir. Amen. The last time I checked, 13 to 17, we don't have no 13 to 17 year olds in here that are movie stars. Nope. We don't have no 13 to 17 year olds in here that are, 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 are soccer players making million dollar checks already. That means that every 13 to 17 year old at Word of Deliverance Ministry, if you don't put a plate in front of them to eat, they're going to starve. Yes, sir. So please help me to understand why they don't feel like it. They don't want to. They're not in the mood. It's carrying the day on the decisions that we are making regarding where our children are or not. Yeah. Reach. Yep. My kids get mad at me all the time. You know how concerned I get about it? <laughs> Not at all. What you going to do? You going to leave? Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, yeah, you might think in your mind before you're going to leave for a minute, but then that big R hit you. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah okay, where you going you to pay rent? Where you going to eat? You going to go out and get your full-time job and support yourself? Mm -hmm. I done told you before, I tell them, the exes are located here and here. <laughs> As for me and my house, yes. we shall serve the Lord. Yeah. See, that's part of the beautiful death. Yeah. It's saying that my house, we're not going to lean to our own understanding. Preach, preacher. Tired does not change devotion time in my house. Yeah. Yeah. The word of God says that Eli was held accountable for the behavior of his sons yes, in the house he had authority over. Yes, sir. There's going to be a reckoning word. If you say you're dead in Christ, then demonstrate it before your children. Where's your sacrifice? Where's your decision made in your household that says, we must be about our father's business? When it comes to the beautiful death, we have to watch out for when the eyes remain. When the eyes remain, when you go through your calculation and you're crossing things out and you're trying to come up with a final solution, be very, very careful when the eye remains. When you're trying to make a decision in life, be very, very careful that the eye does not remain. Let's go to Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your rational or logical service. It makes sense. You know, sin is not rational. Sin don't make sense rationally. There must be a breakdown in your understanding in your mind. The word of God says that when the prodigal son came to himself, yes. that's the word the Bible used that he came to himself. He said, he said, why in the world am I out here fighting these pigs for scraps? Yes. When at my father's house, the servants got excess. He says, I will just simply get up from here and return to my father. He says, and I will make myself as one of the servants. That's what he said. See, there's no rationalness in sin. It's not good for you in any shape, form, or fashion. Does it feel good in the short term? Yes, it does. Do the consequences feel good? No, they never do. Paul is here commanding us that we put the eye aside, that we get rid of it in our decision-making in our lives. This is how you know that You've experienced a beautiful death. 
Look, let me tell you, there, there, there are three ways to tell whether or not you put the eyes aside. Y'all ready? There are three. You know you have not put the eyes aside when the I, when the basically, when the you, when what you feel, or what you think, what you desire, when it overrides or it becomes more important than what the word of God says. Mm -hmm. When you're able to ponder or contemplate something at the end of the day, your response is, well, I know what it says, but I just feel like. I just want to. I just think I should be able to. I just should be able to not come to church today. I know the word of God told me that I need to be at church as often as I'm able to, but I just don't feel like I ought to come today. And these spouses that sit around and, and entertain that from their wives so that they don't have to deal with their wives, that's a big eye that's remaining. A symptom of this is a refusal or excuses made not to read the word. <laughs> if you are struggling to read this word, you need to check the eyes. How can you know what the word of God says if you don't read the word of God? But yet we still have to stand up here and tell people who have been in this ministry time and time again, read your word. Open up your Bible and read it. I talk to people, well, are you reading your word? Well, you know, I, I, I read a couple of verses last week. The eye still remains. You're not dead in Christ. Who, who, name one person you have that you say you love and you don't want to talk to them. Name one person you say you love and you adore and you don't want to hear from them. Oh, see, I'm old school. I came from the version where they had the phone. I grew up where they had the phone before call waiting. Call waiting was just coming along. Where you would sit up in the bed, put your feet up on the wall. And you would talk all night long. Oh, I remember them days. Where you would mess around and you would talk so long and it would be so late, you would fall asleep. And you would hear a voice say, are you still there? And then you have to set your voice up, make it seem like you weren't asleep. Yeah, I'm still here. Talk all night long. Sun go down on the phone. Sun come up on the phone. Both of you fall asleep on the phone. Wake up in the morning. Keep talking. Uh -huh. Talk on the, on the toilet. <laughs> Talk in the kitchen. You remember they put them long. They used to put oh, yeah. them long. Oh, yeah. yeah, you go get that 50, that 50 foot cord. You walk all through the house. That's before they had, that's before they had wireless phones. Uh -huh. Yeah. Brother, you had to take a car and hook it up there. They made a long one. Yeah. Somebody came out and came up with a good idea of making a long one. Yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that you were going to get that conversation in. But we say we've died in Christ. We put aside our own agendas, our own wishes. We want to do what pleases God, but we don't want to hear nothing God says. My wife and I were doing business not too long ago, and we were doing a video chat with the uh, customer service agent and I noticed that their Bible was in the background apparently this person had just came to, came on to work but their Bible was sitting there they had it closed there and as, as we went through the conversation it came up and she said oh yes yeah. she says I'm reading my words she said I just finished up 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 uh, I just finished Psalms and she said and uh, I started on Proverbs yesterday and I'm gonna finish it today I said huh I said, she planned on reading Proverbs in two days. She not playing. I said, she's hungry for the word. I know she wants this. And I gave her a card, y'all prayed for her, that she would come to word. But she had a hunger to know. And we say we have a hunger to know. And you ask how many, how much did you read yesterday? I read three scriptures. Is this kindergarten? How would you say you're a man or woman of God and get outread by Jeremiah? Come on, uh, oh. Uh oh. The eye still remains. 
it's one thing to die in Christ, but, but you realize that you know you can resuscitate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Come on. Right. You understand that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then even worse than that, you know, some people be faking their death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've died in Christ. <sighs> <laughs> Come on, preacher. Who's looking? Come to church. Oh. Check their social media. Living like villains. Why would the men and women of God social media look just like the world? Why in the world would you have a photo out there with you with a butt wise in your hand? But you say you've been delivered and you put away the eye. You want to come in here and portray yourself one way with us and you want to portray yourself another way with the world. You want to have one foot in and one foot out. You playing the spiritual hokey pokey. There's a name for that. I heard hypocrite. That's one. That's one. Has another name for that. That ain't the one I was thinking for. I will accept hypocrite <laughs> as a correct answer. There's another one I'm thinking about. It's called lukewarm. Yes, sir. Oh. oh, yeah. We got one foot in, got one foot out. Yeah. That means you know how to die. You just refuse oh. to die. Uh -huh. See, Jesus said something very interesting over Revelation. He said, that's the worst one. Yep. Yep. You know who I am. You know you're supposed to serve me, but you will not die. You will not get rid of the eye. You keep on clinging on to it. You've been clinging on to it for years. You've seen my, my miracle. You've seen how I've healed. You've seen how I've provided. You've seen how I've kept you. And you refuse to humble yourself to it. You still lift the eye up yeah. more than me. Yeah. See, that's the problem with Judas. Yeah. He walked with Jesus. Yeah. He talked with Jesus. He was with Jesus day and night. But he could not put the eye away. And so as a result of it, he fell. And you will fall. If you're playing that game, make no mistake about it, you will fall. But because he couldn't put the eye away, he had regret. But he couldn't find repentance. See, the danger of not experiencing a beautiful death is that you can always regret it. I'm sorry I got caught. But that, that need to repent, in other words, that need to change, becomes very hard to grasp hold of. And so you see Judas, he, 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 he knew where Jesus was. He found him out in the first place. That's what caused all the trouble. It ain't like Jesus was hidden from him. But where did he go? He went back to the people that gave him the money. He went and found a tree and some rope. He went to everything but the thing that could help him. And this is what happens when you refuse the beautiful death. You'll go to everything out there looking for help. And there is no help. There is no hope. There is no strength. It is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Number two reason. To know when the eye remains. Is you so busy with your stuff? Did I say that right? I, that was a little hood vernacular. You so busy with your stuff that you don't have time to help others. You are so busy crying and fumbling around, worried about your hurt, worried about your health, worried about your problem, worried about your finances, that you don't even acknowledge that there are tons of people out there that got it worse than you. Yeah. 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 You'll get on your knees and you'll pray for 45 minutes when your usual time is 4.5 minutes mm -hmm. for you. Right. Yeah. Because you can't figure out how to get enough money in your bank account to pay next month's bills. Yeah. Yo, are you, you good this month? You're trying to figure out how at the end of next month you're going to have problems if your bills don't get paid. And you got people that, that are standing there calling on God next to you with an eviction notice. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. 
See, this is the mentality that gets us in trouble. When we come to Word of Deliverance Ministries or any church and our focus is on how do you all serve me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't have time for a ministry. I didn't come to serve. I came to be served. Right. Yeah. right. But we say we follow Jesus. Where did Jesus teach us that in his word that he came to be served? The word of God says he came to serve and not be served. If we're following him, then that means there ought to be some evidence. Your eyes should be put aside. You should be on your post, in your position, in your ministries, serving fervently. That means you cannot take unauthorized PTO. Okay, let me help you understand what I'm talking about. That means you can't take unauthorized time off. That, can't, that, that means just because the weather is wonderful at the beach this coming Sunday that you're supposed to carry your happy hips down now. Yeah. <laughs> breeze, breeze. We got people act like it's a, a, a football game. They got three timeouts. <laughs> I don't feel like it. I'll see y'all next week. The eye remains. My wife and I, we have pretty stressful life. It can be pretty stressful. And not because we weren't, just because sometimes it's a lot of stuff going on. And so we get away from time to time. But you won't know it. Because I know how to be back on Sunday morning. You don't know where I was at on Saturday. But you know where I'm going to be at on Sunday. I have a responsibility to my God and to you who I stand before. And I take that very seriously. I can't just run off when I feel like it. I can't just get a bonus check and say, y'all get it how y'all get it till I get back. Preach, preach. The eye still remains. You can't say you serve Jesus. And not be a part of the struggle that's going on in here. When your brothers and sisters heard says we're all one body. Your hand can't just run off and go uh, jump in the pool somewhere because it's hot. We're all joined together. Finally knitted to fitly knitted together. We have a responsibility one to another. But we have to remove the eye in order to accomplish it. The third way we know the eye remains is when we have no time. When we have no time to read, we have no time for choir practice, for usher board, for Sunday school, for brotherhood, street ministry. My question to you is, is what are you doing? That's so important. What's so important that you don't have time for God? I mean, you, you know, or, or, or some of y'all working with, uh, what's that dude on Mission Impossible? Tom Cruise. Y'all working with Tom Cruise? If y'all don't get there in the next three minutes, the whole nation's going to blow up. And so that's why you couldn't make it to, to Sunday school, because you were saving the planet. You were disarming a, a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Because some of us operate like that. We live our lives like what we're doing outside of the will of God, outside of serving God's people, outside of coming to this house of worship and praise is so important that if we don't do it, the world is going to stop. Oh. Yeah. So when did our time get so valuable outside of serving God? That's not a beautiful death. When I look at the life of this woman, whom she's just in, introduced for just a flash, she comes out of nowhere. Just a few scriptures here that covers her. But I look at the eulogy that's given of her in 36. That the woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. When I look at the evidence that's provided of her in 39 when Peter shows up, he said, women were weeping and they were showing, look, look at all the coats and the garments which she made while she was with us. She demonstrates this beautiful death 
because she has lived this life of compassion where there's time and time again examples shown where she had placed her own will and her own needs and her own desires aside to make sure that others had what they needed. This is well pleasing to God. And now she sleeps, if you would. She's already made a decision to die. She didn't have to worry about this. She actually just sleep. You know, one of the things I've learned as I start to get older, it used to be a joke to me now back then, but now it's, it's become something that's a real part of my life, and that's an old man now. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My wife makes fun of me because I'll take my old man naps. I'll go off in there, and she would be like, you going to take a nap at you. I'll be like, I sure am. Sure, yeah, come on now. I'm going to lay down because as I've aged, I've learned that if I can get me a nap, then I'll be prepared for the things that are going to come yes, in the rest of my day. If I know I'm preaching on Wednesday night, I try to get a nap in. That's why I be jumping around up here on Wednesday night because I didn't got my good, get a little rest in. I'd be like, man, that brother animated. Yeah, because I just woke up. <laughs> but I want you to know that Tabitha was just sleeping because she had died earlier. Yes, and so now she's just getting an old person nap. You understand? Because she understands that she's going to get waking up and she got to have be prepared for what else she got to do. See, the word of God tells us over in 1 Thessalonians that Jesus is coming back. And he's going to call to the spirit of God and it's going to return unto him. See, the word of God says here, look, it says that Peter called her by name. It took her by hand and it raised up. The same promise that we have in the word for what took place with Tabitha is going to take place for all of us yeah. that make up our mind that we're dead in Christ. Yeah. That this is not something that we're playing with. That this is not something that we've decided we'll wait till we get old. And then we'll serve him. There's not a guarantee we're going to get old. This is not a thing that we would do half-heartedly or when we feel like it and God has to accept our offering. This is not that. This is about living a life that with a surety, when we realize that we're not going to get out the bed again, when we realize that we're not going to leave that room again, when we realize that we're not going to make it out of that vehicle that was just in the accident, when we come to the reckoning, that man must die. When it becomes true to you, and the responsibility that you must answer for the decisions you made in your life, that big R is right before your face. There's only one thing that will give comfort. And that is knowing that you don't need fear death. That death no longer has a sting because you've already died in Christ. Yeah. Lord, I'm here to encourage you today for this beautiful death that I have talked to you about today. No one regrets it. I look back on my life and the decisions and the things that I did before I made up my mind to serve God and I mourn. Because the answer was right before my face. His salvation was right before my face. His blessings, his peace, his wisdom and his understanding were right before my face and I shunned them so long. Because I did not want to be saddled with the responsibility of preaching his gospel. It's not like not, not wanting to have some broccoli or some Brussels sprouts and then you taste them and realize they're wonderful. The word of God says, oh, taste and see that he is good. Word, I encourage you today that if you haven't made up your mind to truly wholeheartedly experience the beautiful death that comes with being dead in Jesus Christ, that you make up your mind today to receive him. You can't worry about what your friends are going to do. You can't worry about what your family members are going to say. Because none of them are going to be there for you. Or none of them are going to be there with you. At that last moment when you close your eyes. I've stood on the side of bed and watched more people than I like to die. And one minute they're, they're there with you. And the next minute they're all alone. They're no longer able to comprehend those things that are around them. They're on their way out. 
The things of this world are no longer important and they won't be important to you. But if you remember the words of the big headed preacher that stood before you and said, I must be dead in Christ now. I must give my life to Jesus now. I must serve him completely. It can't be what I want. It must be about what he wants. Then on that time, you'll take a deep breath and you'll smile. And there will be no fear. There will be no doubt. There will be no hesitation. There may be a little bit of intrepidation because it's something new. But there won't be any worry or any anxiety. Because the word of God promises that when you close your eyes on this side, when you open him, you're going to see him face to face. You're going to see him with your own eyes. You're going to hear him with your own ears. He's going to say, enter in, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Where we have to have a mind and a heart says that I must hear my father say, enter in, good servant. There cannot be any other option. Hallelujah. And the only way that comes if you make up your mind to surrender. It's a beautiful death. It's a death that brings forth life. Will you surrender today?